The discussion of how humans process the speech input signal requires a precise understanding of the analysis of sound waves. And that's the focus of this short e-lecture. We will first of all look at simple and then at complex sounds, discuss the phenomenon of resonance and eventually say something about the variation of the speech signal. Well, let's start with a very simple form of sound that is uh, represented by a simple tone, for example, an electronic noise that represents standard pitch A. This is what it sounds like. Now, in order to represent such a sound visually, we have two types of representation. On the one hand, we have the so-called waveform view. And the second representation is the spectrogram or the spectrographic spectrogram, spectrographic view. Now, what do these views display? Well, the waveform view is a two-dimensional view where you have time information on the horizontal axis. Within this, we have frequency information by means of cycles per time unit. And then we have the amplitude on the vertical axis. The spectrographic information is three-dimensional. We have time information again on the horizontal axis, normally expressed in terms of milliseconds. We have the frequency information in terms of hertz on the vertical axis. And the third dimension, in inverted commas, is the amplitude displayed in decibels by means of different colors or by means of different degrees of darkening. The darker, the more intensive. Now, what can we see on this spectrogram? Well, we can see precise frequency information. For example, we can see that our simple tone um, involved a frequency of, and we know this value, 440 hertz. This is the frequency of our sound input. Well, and this sound input frequency is referred to as F0 or F0, or in full, you call it fundamental frequency. Now, if we enlarge these two views, then you will see that an enlargement of the spectrogram doesn't really help. It's the same information. If we enlarge the waveform view, we can see the cycles per time unit. So this would be one cycle here. And you see the amplitude in terms of the distance from the maximal elongation uh, to the zero line. What happens if we feed the simple tone that is produced by a sound source through a resonating body? For example, the body of a guitar or the vocal track or the tube of a flute. Well, let's take my flute as an example. This is what it sounds like when resonances are created, created by the flute body. Ooh, I've been carried away a little bit. So let's just play and record one single sound, the uh, standard pitch A again. Now let's look at the acoustic analysis of it. Well, here we are again. The waveform view to the left with an enlargement and the spectrographic information. Well, what can we see? Now the waveform displays a complex sound wave which is fully periodic. The periodicity you can see here in the enlargement. Enlargement. This is one cycle again. But you see it's now a combination of several simple sounds. However, apart from the intensity information, and if we zoom in the precise amplitudes, it is similar to that of a simple sound wave. The spectrographic information, the spectrogram, is different. It does not only display the fundamental frequency, which is here, F0, 440 hertz again, but it also 
displays multiples of the fundamental frequency. So here are the multiples. This is one, this is one, this is one, and this is one. And furthermore, we have additional um, effects such as the representation of noise, which was probably created by turbulence airflow created at the whole of the flute here. Now, since frequency information and information about additional sound effects, noise, pulses, etc., is fundamental for the phonetic analysis of speech, the spectrographic information is the primary means of acoustic analysis in phonetics. But what about these additional frequencies, these here, these multiples? Well, whenever a sound is not just a simple input signal, but it is filtered, intensified and damped, by the parts of the resonating body, then we get these resonance frequencies, or as you call them, formants. Or formant frequencies. Now, the formants are, well, if you wish, the echoes from the resonating body. Let us now compare our musical instrument with speech. I have produced the following two vowels and analyzed them acoustically. E and R at 440 hertz. E, R. Now here is the analysis. Again, the values for the fundamental frequencies are the same. At least I try to produce similar tones. But the formants have different vowel values. This is due to the different shapes of the resonating body that is my vocal tract. So here are our F0 value. We know it's about 440 hertz. At least I try to produce that. And then we have the value for F1, which in the E is part of the big bundle here at the bottom. Whereas for R, it's much higher. It's about here, around 1,000 hertz. And then we have our second formant, F2, which in the E is extremely high. And in the example of an R, it is somewhere in the middle. Now, how can we explain that? Now, let's imagine the following. Let's imagine the vocal tract to be analyzed just like the resonating body of a flute. We have the sound input here at this end of the flute, and we have the orifice here. So we have exactly the same in the uh, vocal tract. This is our sound input, and this is the orifice, our sound output. Now what happens if we produce, if we produce an E? Well, something like this. We produce a constriction which is very much at the front of the mouth. In other words, we produce a very large back cavity and a relatively small front cavity. The situation is different if we produce an R. Then the constriction occurs in the middle with a back cavity and a front cavity, well, relatively equal in size. So, and the interesting thing is that we can now associate front and back cavity with parts of the vocal tract. The back resonance cavity is associated with F1. You see, everything in red here has to do with F1. F1. Well, at the front cavity, well, that is associated with F2. So, F2. and F1. With this information, we can now create patterns for all vowels. If you produce an E, you have a very large back cavity, that is a very low frequency for F1, and a very small front cavity, which means you create a high value for F2. If we now use real present-day English words, then the format patterns are even more complex. 
Well, here I produce two words, sea and car. Standard words of present day English. Now, this time I didn't use the 440 hertz fundamental frequency input value, but I produced um, a sound which can be used in normal speech. So something like C and car with a falling tone in each case. And that is represented in my fundamental frequency, which is somewhere here, F naught, somewhere here. F not again, a value between something like 180 hertz down to 120 hertz. Now, F1, our first formant in E, well, as we know, is probably here, is a very low value. For R, it's somewhere here. And then we have a very high value for F2 in C, in the E as in C, and well, a median value for F2 in car. Now these spectrographic representations involve some sort of complication. For example, here we have friction noise, we have an alveolar fricative, here we have a velar plosive, you see this little spike here, and the puff of air which represents the aspiration component. Well, and this phonetic context seemed to influence the representation of the form and patterns of the vowels. Well, this is even more complex if we look at connected speech or longer passages. So here we have uh, a complex stretch of speech, for example, in this case, the virtual linguistics campus. And now we have the whole vocal tract working as one resonant system. The fundamental frequency of vocal fold vibration varies between 100 and 200 hertz. Whereas the form and patterns of vowels can be identified, there are additional problems. Speech sounds can often not be clearly identified. So, for example, where is the E here? Well, is, it, is this really the E or is it the E plus the velar nasal, as in linguistics? Speech sounds are influenced by their acoustic context. Well, as we see, um, for example, here, the formants, they seem to emerge from a certain position, so they are curved in a way, so they're not straightforward as in our steady state vowels. And then we have additional complications such as background noise, distortions, missing segments. All this complicates the acoustic analysis of speech. And then there are further problems. Speakers have different vocal tract shapes. They use different input sources, women versus men, for example. And, as already pointed out, the phonetic context influences the formant, pattern, formant patterns. Well, these phenomena of variation will be discussed in another e-lecture about the nature of the input signals.